and then how you doing London? Uh, <laughs> hey, nice gear, man. I see you're ready to go. Dude, I am kitted out today. <laughs> Sports, <laughs> underwear, socks? Or that's too okay. much? Uh, no socks. I do have a pair of socks, though. Okay, Loyal, okay. Loyal socks. That's fine, man. That's fine. Thanks for taking the time, guys. I got about 25 minutes because then we have a team meeting. No hey, worries. That's all we need. Oh, no okay. worries, man. Thank you for taking the time to be a part of this podcast. I really appreciate this, Len. My Great. pleasure. Thanks for having um, me. So I guess the first thing, the first question I wanted to ask you is, first and foremost, how are you doing and uh, how are you doing personally and professionally as well? With the COVID stuff, especially. Yeah, so personally, um, somewhere between loving my kids but not liking them very much. <laughs> um, but at the same time, very grateful that I'm not in a hospital, on a ventilator, et cetera. So it's, yeah. you know... We, we try to keep life in perspective, but also it doesn't mean that it's easy all the time with three little kids. No, I understand. And yeah, professionally, it's been tough, right? Because our guys are, you guys know, for players right now, it's not easy. Um, they're anxious. They want to do what they love to do for a living. They just want to be out in the sunshine and get some exercise, right? So it's, mm -hmm. it's been tricky, but we try to we try to keep it in perspective and let them know that it could be a lot worse. Yeah. Um, in this new role now at San Diego as a manager and as an owner, uh, what is it like for you? And then also, do you sometimes get the itch to practice with the team? <laughs> I'm really enjoying it. Uh, the, the off the field stuff actually is enjoyable, sometimes a little tedious, but I, I do enjoy it. But I really, really love being with the guys every day. I, my personal mission is to positively impact their lives, however yeah. I can, right? And there's lots of ways, hopefully, to do that. But I do really, really enjoy every day. Um, once in a while, I jump in. I'll jump into 5v2 or we'll play yeah. soccer tennis or something. I am tempted sometimes. <laughs> um, but then I also am reminded that, that the level is so much better than I realized, right? Because I was used <laughs> to the MLS or national team level. Mm -hmm. And the old probably six years ago when I retired, the thought of USL was the level was much, much lower. Yeah. And the reality today is you have so many guys who we, I think we have seven guys who in the last few years were on MLS rosters. We have guys playing for their national teams. Mm -hmm. This is a much different league than it was even five years ago. Brilliant. But Len, this is uh, Jesse Jam of the company along with Godwin. Um, quick question for you. Just, uh, directed towards our young guys in the organization. Obviously, mentality and having a strong mentality is really important in succeeding in football. Um, can you speak on you know, the type of mentality you had as a young player going into professional football and like what, what helped you succeed and uh, become the player that you were? So I was, honestly, I was just fortunate because I was so driven to succeed. And I didn't realize till I got older why that was, subconsciously why that was. I was I was looking for an identity and acceptance. I mean, that's really like, I, I was, I was, I remember being like eight years old and playing in a youth tournament and scoring a goal and 50 people on the sideline cheering. And I would like sprint down the sideline because I was so <laughs> excited to see their acceptance yeah. and their reaction. And that was the same feeling I had when I scored the goal in front, when I scored a goal in front of 40,000 people. It was mm -hmm. the same feeling. So I was just so driven to succeed it wasn't um it wasn't like driven to get out of a bad situation or a bad childhood or to mm -hmm. make money or i was just i just wanted people to see me i wanted yes. to be noted and so that was my drive all the time and that's how when you when you have that mentality mm -hmm. and you can't make it you can't mm -hmm. manufacture it but when you have it you do anything i mean i would do anything to be successful and i did Got it. Yeah, um, living in LA, um, playing for a major club uh, in the MLS, LA Galaxy. How did you deal with the stardom and and maintaining that focus through that time? So, stardom has good and bad, right? Stardom when I would go to a restaurant and there was no parking and the valet recognized me and they would take my car and valet it for free was amazing. Yeah. Right? <laughs> then being in the restaurant, you're eating with your family and seven different people come over and interrupt you because they want to take pictures and autographs. That's yeah. 
you know, it could be worse, but it's not always ideal. Yeah. So the, the, the reason it worked for me is because I was always very introverted and wanted to just be home and preparing for the next day of training or game. So I was never out much dealing with that. And if I did go out, I would have a hat on or glasses on or re remain somewhat incognito. So I didn't have to worry about it too much um, from that standpoint. And then the, the game day and uh, doing media or appearances or commercials, like I learned to actually embrace that because I knew it was helping the sport. And so I would almost become like a different persona in those mm -hmm. times. And I was at home and, yeah. I, and I sort of just let it be what it was, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't inauthentic, but it wasn't exactly who I wanted to be like I was at home. So I, I would lean into it a little bit. Now, you had, a, of course, you had a very long and successful career. In terms of, you know, professional football, what was your favorite thing? And maybe what was the, the least favorite thing or the toughest part that young aspiring footballers um, should prepare them for themselves for? Good question. So in this country, it's probably different than others because as a professional in this country, the traveling is really hard. And mm -hmm. now Major League Soccer is on the brink of getting charter flights or private flights. Mm -hmm. But at the time, I mean, traveling four or five hours and making a connection is really hard on your body. Mm -hmm. And so that takes a lot out of you over the course of a year or the course of three years or five years or seven years. So the actual travel, being on the plane, playing card games, hanging out with the guys is great. But the thought of being at the airport for two hours on your feet, walking really? through terminals, all that kind of stuff mm -hmm. gets really, really heavy over the course of a season. Mm -hmm. So that part, I kind of, uh, over time, I didn't like that. The best mm -hmm. part, I think most players would say this, um, is just the camaraderie with teammates, right? Yeah. Whether it's in the locker room, on the road. Um, it just, there are very few things in life that allow you to be around 20 other people who are very similar to you that really yeah. understand you and get you and you can be emotional with, but then laugh with, but then mm -hmm. be hard on and compete together with. I mean, there's, there's nothing like that. So that part is amazing. Wonderful. Um, moving on from that, then you played in three world cups. So you 17 world cup. Um, I got to ask, what was your most memorable moment, you know, on the pitch at a world cup and also off the pitch that you were like, Hey, this is the World Cup or something like that. Mm. Mm. Um, so on the pitch, I mean, scoring a goal in a World Cup is... <laughs> it's probably is, amazing, eh? Favorite yeah. goal, though. <laughs> yeah, it's... What's that? Favorite goal, though. Yeah, so... I, the Algeria goal for what it meant for U.S. Yes. soccer, but as far as favorite just favorite goal was probably the header against mexico in 2002 yes. because it was our rival and it, mm -hmm. it knocked them out <laughs> the World Cup and, and put us to the quarterfinals mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. so that that was a like that was a truly special goal um off mm -hmm. the field there's so many cool moments because yes. i actually for the first time had sushi when we played mm -hmm. in 2002 in korea that was the first time i'd ever had sushi so we brought a chef with us Mm -hmm. One day there was just all this like fish sitting out in the meal room, mm. and I was thinking like, <laughs> I, I grew up in like this tiny little town in in California. I'd never I'd never had sushi before, so like that was a cool experience. Having the ability to go in Germany, we stayed in mm -hmm. Hamburg and to go to different um, like the fan center and walk around and just see these people like from Sweden next to someone from Zimbabwe next to someone from Argentina yeah. hanging out with someone yeah. from Holland. It was like, yeah. it was such this cool moment to see people loving this sport the way I do from all parts of the world. So those moments are really cool. Brilliant. Thanks for sharing that. Ghana, what are you going to How did it feel uh, to lose against Ghana? You know, my back, I'm originally from Ghana, so I, I think it is. <laughs> I swear, like, that was the one team we couldn't beat. Yeah. Um, and actually, believe it or not, when I was with the under-17s, we played them in the World Cup as yeah. well. Yeah. place mm -hmm. game and lost. Mm -hmm. and, and so, couldn't beat them there. Lost to them in 06. Yeah. Lost to them in 2010. Mm. 
Uh, they were just a team I couldn't beat, man. Yeah. I don't know. Quickly, I got to ask, do you remember playing against Michael Essien at the U-17s? Of course. of course. Was he a beast, but he was the same guy? Of course. Yeah, yeah. I was going to be the same size <laughs> then as he was as a man. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to ask Landon, on the Ghana national team, quickly, who was who somebody that you were, like, uh, you know, playing them a couple times, you were like, wow, he actually surprised you on the pitch? Uh, well, Essien didn't surprise me, but, like, Asamo Gian was, yeah. was, was special. Yeah. I think he scored mm-hmm. against us in 2010. Mm-hmm. Um, he just moved. He moved so fluid. Like, yeah. he, he would start running and moving with the ball. He was, he was, a, he was a very good player. Very good. That's all. Perfect. So now I got to ask quickly, how much did the Vuvuzelas affect you guys in, the, in 2010? I know a lot of players said it wasn't great, but how Actually, about, how not, was at all. It? not at all. No. You know, I be, so, okay. So I'll say this. So when we first went out on the field in warm up, yeah. mm. and it was, you know, it was pretty annoying or whatever. Mm. But then I kept hearing people talk about it during the games. Oh, wow. And during the game, you're in full focus mode. So like, I don't hear my coaches. I barely hear my teammates. Definitely don't hear the fans. I wasn't going to hear Zellas or anything else. So I didn't understand why people kept, I'm like, why do people keep talking about this? So stupid. (laughs) Like we lost, I flew home. I turned on, I think one of the quarterfinals and I heard it on TV and I'm like, oh my God, this is terrible. So then I finally understood. You gotta apologize for that, man. As Africans, uh, sorry about that. That's okay. I like it. I like when I like when the culture seeps into like. So that was part of the South Africa experience. And in O2 in Korea, we they they developed like a few nationwide cheers that they would sing everywhere. So like every game outside the stadium in the fan zone, or whatever, they'd be like chanting all together. And when we actually got to play against South Korea in the World Cup, we walked out in the stadium. I will never forget this. Mm. Walk out in the stadium for warm up. Mm. The entire, I'm getting goosebumps. The entire stadium, yeah. like 50, 60,000, full already in warm ups, mm. all with a red T, same red t shirt on. Entire yeah. stadium. And yeah. they were chanting these, like, whatever. The one was like, Korea team fighting or like whatever it was, <laughs> some made up whatever, but the whole stadium did it and the whole country did it. It was insane. That's spectacular. Another question about the 2002 World Cup, beating Portugal. What was that like for you in terms of just, you know, getting into football? That must have been massive. <laughs> so we had like, there were, that was one of those days where everything had to go right. Yeah. yeah. Cause they were one of the best teams in the world at the time. Yeah. So what happened is we started camp um, probably three weeks before any other, certainly any other European team, because European teams were still playing their season. Yes. So all these guys who were amazing players were coming off these long seasons. So they started like August and they would go through the winter and then into June for the World Cup. Mm-hmm. But most of our guys, half of our team, I think, came from Major League Soccer. Mm-hmm. And so we started playing in March. So by June, we were like in prime peak form, totally. Yeah. And they were tired. Like those teams yeah. were tired. European teams, every World Cup, they're tired. Yeah. yeah. And so we used that to our advantage. I mean, we were, I have never been so fit in my life. We were mm-hmm. so fit. And mm-hmm. we just, we just hit them in the mouth. They weren't ready. We just punched them in the mouth, three goals after like 30 minutes. Mm-hmm. And they almost got that if the game had been 10 minutes longer, they would have tied it. Yeah. But they just couldn't catch up. And that was, I mean, that was the start of a really special tournament. That's amazing. It was a tournament of surprises for sure. Yeah. Um, Goddard, should we wrap it up with the Q&A? Yeah, we'll wrap it up with a Q&A. All right, quick, Landon. So we're going to put you in a little bit of a tight spot. Okay. Um, Landon, as the manager, you got to pick a player in the prime to build your team, okay? First one. Go. Oh, okay. You're going to, okay. Yeah, in the prime. So... Uh, first one, Ronaldo Lima R9 or CR7? Ronald, say it again, sorry. Ronaldo Lima, so R9 oh, or no, okay, yeah, CR7? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, jeez. <laughs> <laughs> it gets harder, man. Yeah. Probably CR7. CR7? We ain't, ain't going to ask about him. Okay, um, the next person is Francesco, Francesco Totti or uh, Zidane? Ooh. Well, you'll see, like, you'll learn, you'll see a pattern here. So I go with Zidane. Like, I'm going with the more reliable. Okay. Yeah? Okay. Okay, okay. Then I got to ask them, if you're going to go Zidane versus Iniesta. Oh, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm going to 
probably perfect. still Zidane. Is it mm-hmm. perfect, yeah. um, Andre, uh, Andreas Clearlo or Xavi Hernandez? Xavi Hernandez. Yeah. Last one, this hits close to home. Kobe Jones versus Claudio Reyna. <laughs> uh, oh man, I can't win with this one. No, uh, in their prime, yes, sir. Well, I mean, I played with Kobe a lot, so I gotta say, you gotta Kobe. stick with your boy, yeah. Kobe. And I love Claudia, was probably Claudia was probably the most uh calm player I ever played with. Yeah. Like, he he could take a game that was 100 miles an hour and, like, step on the ball, roll it one way, and the whole game would just pause. It's tough for it was like, it was amazing. You got to find the players and bring the players that are, that are of, of value. Great and level. Then that's how it works. Hey, Landon, you're going to be hearing from us soon, man. Thank you. Thank you so I much. It. You guys keep grinding, man. You're doing great. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Stay safe, guys. We will. You too, boss.